And today on the show, uh, I am joined by two members of possibly the most beloved Scottish band of the 80s and 90s, uh, with singles like Row to Me, Always the Last to Know. I am delighted to be joined by Justin Curry and Ian Harvey of Delamitri. Guys, how are you doing? Hi, Chris. I, I think know. the Proclaimers are the most beloved band of the 80s and 90s. I don't know. I don't know. Well, anyway, that's a bit, it was probably the most beloved. That's a bit like those beer adverbs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there was always that famous rivalry between Delamitri and the Proclaimers, wasn't there? Well, we were, we were never rivals. We, were always, we, we did a gig with them really early on, and we thought, good Lord, they're, they're amazing. A mutual yeah. understanding. Yeah, and we do kind of different things, you know. Um, and we, we, we shared a road crew for years as well, so we kind of got each other's gossip. Oh, I mean, do we have any gossip on the on the Proclaimers to share? You do. No, that's not in public. <laughs> not in uh, so, guys, it's been uh, it's been nearly twenty years since we last had a studio album mm. from Delamitri, and you're back now with uh, Fatal Mistakes. So, I suppose the first and most obvious question is: twenty years? Why now? Was why why was this the right time to get back into the fold? We didn't think. Uh... I mean, the, because the phone wasn't really ringing, nobody was offering us anything, so we weren't sure whether we would ever do anything again. Uh, and we, we wrote a lot of songs in the interim um, that never saw the light of day, so we were still working together and meet, meeting up reasonably frequently and, and doing other things, you know, doing other sort of musical things. Uh, but then we got we started getting promoters sniffing around, uh, so it was 2012, 2013, offering quite a lot of money to do gigs and that, that made us think god that's quite good because back when we toured in the in the 90s ticket prices were really cheap and um the whole kind of live the, the whole live side of the music business was um kind of run by the record companies so the, the record companies used to underwrite everything and that had all changed in the time that we'd been away and uh, we thought oh god we could actually cover our costs and and, and make some money doing some daily music gigs, which might or might not be fun. So, and then it turned out to be great fun when we came back in 2014. We enjoyed it much more than we thought we would. So that led to thinking about doing more gigs and then inevitably, oh, well, we should maybe write some new material for daily music because it's going to be a bit boring if we do more gigs without doing new songs. So the gigs kind of led to the material and then the material led to the idea of making a, an album. And uh, just speaking of the material, uh, obviously it's been released at uh, a quite a tumultuous time for the world. Uh, a lot of artists, they recorded music under lockdown because they were looking for something to do. But Fatal Mistakes, on the other hand, it's not so much a lockdown album so much as it was just a victim of bad timing when it comes to what mm -hmm. happened with the pandemic. I mean, is it true that you finished recording the day before lockdown? It is, yes. Just sheer coincidence, but yes. Was there a sense of urgency to sort of finish the recording of the album before what we saw as the inevitable happening? Well, we, 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 we had a sort of panic meeting at one point because we didn't know when they were going to shut the country down. So we had a lot of gear from Glasgow sitting in the middle of Worcestershire. And we thought we'd better get the gear out in case we get stuck. Uh, so we got the gear out on the Thursday and we were due to finish the album on the Saturday, which we did. We did the last overdub at like half midnight on the Saturday night and then scarpered on the Sunday and lockdown starting on the Monday. So that was really lucky uh, that we, so, we, you know, we recorded all those things with everybody in the room, so, which we couldn't have done post lockdown. Uh, and then it got a bit tricky. Mixing was quite tricky. And obviously the album got rescheduled from the autumn to the beginning of the year and then it got rescheduled to now. Um, so that was that was a victim of circumstances, but the recording of it um, was really fortuitous that we got it all in, all done before mm -hmm. lockdown. But, but musically, it's not a lockdown album at all. I mean, it was all written in this uh, three years. Uh, in fact, mostly in a kind of a six month period. But you know, that was there's nothing to do with lockdown. What the material's about, although some of it does seem a bit prescient, but. <laughs> Um, the with the fact that you had an album recorded and then lockdown hit, obviously you still had mixing and promotion to do, but without the the urgency of getting an album recorded, did you pick up any other hobbies over the the, the past year or so? Somebody asked me this uh, the, other, the other night. I don't like the idea of hobbies, and I think if you're a musician, it kind of is your hobby. Mm. You know, like if I've got spare time, I'll go and I'll sit and I'll play the guitar and I'll try and 
write something. You know, in a sense, that's my hobby. Um, so if you don't have a job, you can't really have hobbies, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, that's right. So there's and no... what are hobbies anyway? Hobbies are like, I don't know, train spotting's a hobby, isn't it? And stamp collecting. I, don't, I, don't well, know. I, I mean, I know that I'm being, I'm being facetious, but no, I mean, your time is, your time, I don't, I don't, I don't really feel as if I've got spare time. So you didn't have time just for a little sourdough bread at all, no? But you know, I did that anyway, so there you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of two hobbies then. Um, um, okay, so that's a hobby. I've got a hobby. No, no, no. I learned the new skill of not going to the pub on Friday nights. That was a, a steep learning experience. Mm. And I, but no. to, be, um, to be more serious, actually, it did occur to me, I lived in Spain for a while and I kind of lost all my Spanish. So I thought, all oh, right, I kind of, I'll, I'll sort of get my Spanish back up to speed. But of course I didn't. And I just, you know, and I, and I sort of felt, you know, like 12 months after, I was like, because, you know, if I'd actually done that, I would have my Spanish problems. But, and I started kind of, sort of beating myself up about it. And I just thought, that's stupid, you know. Trying to set sort of arbitrary things to do when you're emotionally at sea is a terrible mm. idea. Definitely. And I think that there does seem to be a sort of conversation and a lot of pressure of, you know, we should be using this time for self-improvement. And nobody wants to do self-improvement. My on hobby was making sure I didn't get COVID. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Because it, well, it, like, it sounds like a mess. <laughs> yeah, avoiding COVID, that was, that was a new skill we developed. So just to go back a little bit, the, uh, the the two of you have been in the band basically since the beginning. Um, and I think a lot's changed in, you know, the pop scene and the, the music industry um, since the early days. Is there anything particularly striking, especially since you had, you know, a, a quite a long hiatus. Is there anything particularly striking about you, about what's changed in the music industry or or what's expected of artists um, since you began back in the 80s? Well, there's a lot more things you can do and there's a lot more things you get asked to do, um, especially with lockdown and the technology being the way it is. You get asked to do an awful lot of things that strike us as being just kind of rank amateurism. So, I mean... The, the the hungriness of the um, of the internet is quite shocking. I mean, you know, you, you could uh, you could easily work eight hours a day just feeding the internet with stuff. So that's tricky if you're not if you're not used to doing all that. And it, because the technology also you can you can do really good shows now just with like a bunch of people playing playing on the stage because the, the sounds better and the lights are better and you know you can like technically you can. Because the, the, the advances in technology mean that you can do better live shows even without all that, um, which is quite interesting. Because, I mean, we used to do shows you'd know it. You couldn't hear anything you were playing, and you weren't entirely sure if the audience could hear anything because the <laughs> PAs were so awful. The PAs you- used to feedback, feedback all the time. Somebody pointed this out to me. I was speaking to a sound guy about 10 years ago, and I was going, God, you don't hear, you don't hear microphones feeding back anymore. Um, I mean, a lot of our early gigs were just, Howls of feedback all the time, and the, the sound guy said no because they've just they just designed the boxes so well now they just don't really feed back. So yeah, as as Ian's saying, the technology's moved on. That it's it's much easier now standing on a, a large stage, playing live than, than, mm. than it used to be. We used to tour America, and every day you turn up, and there'd be a different lot of rubbish that you'd have to sing through, and you could never hear what you as Ian said, you could never hear what you especially what you were singing because you'd get these awful wedges that didn't really work and, uh, and I was just, uh, uh, as I was saying it was just feedback all the time so that's well, got that, a lot better Yeah, I mean that was that was a bit of a touring skill being able to play sort of give a sort of reasonable possible performance without having feel really been able to hear anything yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's improved so that's improved since 1982 and do you think that's better or do you miss the kind of slightly more lo-fi setup of, of earlier gigs? Uh, no fi so don't for it. It was just bad fi, sorry. Just yeah. bad fi, okay. Or, uh, or no fi. Uh, no, I don't miss that at all. And actually, I mean, you know, it really messed a lot of people's hearing because they were just getting turned up and turned up. Your, your instinct, if you can't hear what you're doing, is to get, just turn that up, turn that up, turn that up. So, I mean, a lot of musicians of our generation have, got, have really got their ears screwed up by, by all that. <laughs> In a way, this is interesting, though, because what we're, what we're talking about is how things have changed. And I think quite a large theme on Fatal Mistakes is the idea of change and, yeah. you know, how time just sort of marches on. Um, I want to draw attention to the single, uh, You Can't Go Back. 
Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about the music video um, in which the band uh, basically dress up as geriatric versions of themselves and uh, just seem to have just seem to have a lot of fun, basically. That must have been a very fun video to record. Yeah, well, the, the video director, uh, Stuart Alexander, came up with the idea of parodying the, or updating the Roll To Me video where we were <laughs> playing babies in prams pushed around by models, effectively. Uh, and he said, well, now your now you're old gits in mobility scooters being pushed around by your carers. And that, that just struck <laughs> us as being absolutely hilarious. And it was a laugh to do because we were just, jumping in cars and going to locations and, and shooting for 10 minutes and then jumping back in, in cars again and going somewhere else. So it was all done guerrilla style. So, yeah, there was no, um, yeah, there wasn't like a big crew and all that sort of stuff made everything really slow. So it was, it was shot in a, in a mad rush. It was, it was a hoot to do it. It might seem like an obvious question, but why was the theme of like time moving on? did it seem that that was what this album should be about? Why this album should be the one that, that talks about this fairly sensitive issue for a lot of people? Well, you don't sit down and decide what the themes are going to be on an album. You just write a bunch of songs and then you start collating. You start, well, you start deciding what's going to work in the studio at this point, And then you start getting rid of things that you don't think quite fit or things that are repeating themselves. Um, and it's only later on you think, well, maybe there is a bit of a, a theme here. That's just n not by design at all. That's quite accidental. Mainly you're trying to get the songs to work on the album musically so that it, mm. it flows together in a nice way. There was a kind of conscious approach to how it was going to sound, though, because we, yeah. we did decide it was just going to be the band as it was. It's a the only record we've made actually was doesn't have a single other player on it. I mean, every record we made either has ended up with some brass players or somebody shaking a tambourine or something. Actually, the, well, it was only after we finished it at Curtis that it was just the five of us on the record. Um, and we did quite self consciously decide it was just going to be that 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 kind of classic. It's almost a classical um, way of playing these kinds of songs with two guitars, bass, and drums, and that was a kind of that was almost going back to how we'd wanted to make Waking Hours, although we ended up with all kinds of stuff on Waking Hours. There was banjos and fiddles and all <laughs> kinds of stuff going on there. Um, but that was, a, that, was a, that was a mindset that we kind of went back to and actually carried through more fully than we've ever really done in the past. And it feels that kind of that slightly more stripped back sound. It, it kind of brings the band almost full circle, which is mm -hmm. very sort of which is very nice considering the, the, the kind of overtones of what the album's about. Now that this album's out, are we planning more studio albums in the near future at all? So, I'm just certainly th thinking about it. And uh, there's, there's more sort of outtakes from this album that will probably come out next year or they're talking about putting those things out next year. Uh, yeah, I, we'll, we'll sort of start thinking about that after we get some touring under a belt because you want to get a feeling for what the audience uh, pick up on it's always quite surprising what the audience pick up on sometimes you think you rehearse a song or you rehearse a new song and you think oh this is going to be really good in concert and it just goes down really badly <laughs> so that, that 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 kind of those reactions help you feel your way into what you're doing next I, I don't think we have a particularly clear idea of what we'll, what we'll do next well, on that note then, just to sort of finish off, let's talk about the touring, because obviously, you, you know, you had this tour planned last year and things just mm -hmm. didn't go to plan. Uh, but this new tour uh, that we've got lined up for 2021, I believe it starts in September, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. We're seeing you in Perth on the 14th of October. Uh, we can't wait for that. Hopefully, nothing else goes wrong in the, and, and this tour will be an absolute go. I don't know if that's something you're cautious about or whether it's just something you have to just... Well, we were, fire on we, we, we were extremely sceptical about all plans until these gigs were actually announced. And once mm. it, once the gig's announced, you've just got to assume it's going to happen. That's the only way to play, really. Uh, but up to that, that point, Ian and I were like, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but once you see them on a poster, it feels real. And it yeah. feels like the promoter's confident and the agent's confident and we're confident. So until... Until the meteorite hits or the meteor hits next week, uh, <laughs> we're we're you know we're, we're just going full steam ahead and we'll start rehearsing and we'll just start getting some shows under our belt.
Fantastic. We can't wait. Uh, I think that's uh, all we've got time for. Uh, Justin, Ian, thank you very much for joining me. Of course, Fatal Mistakes is our album of the week on Heart on Death FM at the moment. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely love it. Uh, And just before we wrap up, I was hoping that maybe you'd like to introduce uh, your latest single for us. I'm Justin from Delamitri. And I am Ian from said Delamitri. And this is our latest single. You can't go back.